The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Reformation Sunday. Today we observe the 504th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, a day that, we, uh, that began October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther posted his 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. It is good to be together and to worship together, and in case you haven't noticed, the color of the day is... Red, yes. Um, I have several announcements, but first, Tom Batterman has a few words to share. A number of months ago, it was decided that our organ could use a good upgrade. Now, perhaps some of you have uh, heard the phrase with computer hardware and software, plug and play. Uh, that was not this. This was more like plug away and plug away uh, to get where we are today. So I would like to mention uh, a special thanks to Steve Poling, uh, who did Yeoman's effort to get everything set up the, uh, the way it is. So I hope you will see that this will uh, enhance our worship experience and that you will feel like perhaps that you're in a uh, multi-story cathedral in England, uh, rather here at Abiding Christ. So my final words if I borrow from uh, Winston Churchill is, this is not the beginning of the end, this is the end of the beginning. <laughs> and uh, we will have more work to do to uh, kind of tweak and vocalize the different ranks over the next weeks. So, thank you. Thank you, Tom. And yes, thank you to Steve for uh, the hours that, I, that I've seen him in here. And I know it's been hours that I haven't been here that he has, so thank you. Also, thank you to those who prepared the breakfast for First Lutheran Church's ministry, for those experiencing homelessness in downtown Dayton. They were here at 6 o'clock this morning to prepare and package the breakfast. Today, blood pressure checks are available between the worship services in the, in the parish nurse's office. Trunk or treat is also happening today from 4 to 5.30. You can decorate your trunk in the parking lot and hand out candy. The All Saints Garden is, is set up. The flowers were all made by volunteers of the Worship Arts Group, and next week you will have the opportunity to write the name of a loved one on a leaf to put beside one of the flowers. The, the garden leads all the way down uh, out this door and all the way down toward the office and around the corner to the Memorial Garden. And in case you didn't know, our memorial garden is a meditative place where families may inter the ashes of their loved ones. Each of the 61 plots may accommodate two sets of ashes, and there are ashes interred in 31 of those plots, and another 15 plots have been reserved. Again, the, the All Saints garden goes down the hallway toward the office and around the corner. Leaving a legacy and estate planning workshop that will be held here on Saturday, November 13th at 1030. Please RSVP by calling the office. Shoebox Christmas boxes are available at the Welcome Center for you to take and fill and return by November 17th to help children around the world. And then today, uh, at our 11 o'clock worship service, we rejoice with Sammy Greeneisen, Alexandra Tuttle, and Ryan Irvin, and all their families as they will affirm their baptisms today in the confirmation service. So we celebrate with them. In our prayers, um, we pray for Maria Damsky. She fell earlier this week and she is in the hospital um, for recuperation and then we'll spend some time in rehab uh, uh, from following, from following that, that fall and being in the hospital. We keep Maria in our prayers and she is in Connecticut uh, at this time. We also pray for Mary Cooper who is, was in the hospital this week Matt Snyder is having shoulder surgery tomorrow. We also pray for Lakeisha Hicks and her son Joseph, both of whom have some, some health concerns and, and health issues. Uh, for Tammy Brower, we're continuing prayers for health concerns. We also pray for Tyler Balance for upcoming surgery to remove a cyst. 
And we pray for Karen Harris, whose car was hit by another car in a parking lot while she was getting into the car uh, this week. And so she has uh, a broken nose and lots of bruising. So we remember her in our prayers. Um, and also um, prayers for the Tetmeyer family as the memorial service for Ruth Tetmeyer was here yesterday afternoon. In sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, let us continue our worship as we listen to our prelude this morning. As you are able, I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we are in bondage, bondage to sin, sin and, and cannot free ourselves. ourselves. We, we have, have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Oh. peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord, Lord For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson is from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. 
The second lesson is from the third chapter of Romans. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for though through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory, Glory to you. Lord. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and we have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. The children are now dismissed for children's time with Mrs. McGee and with Pastor June. The apocryphal story goes that when Luther died, he went to heaven and he went to the waiting room where St. Peter was in charge of the welcome desk. And he was informed that uh, he had to have an entry interview with Jesus before he could get into heaven. And with him in that uh, waiting room were two other giants of the Reformation, John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli. They were also waiting for their entry interview into heaven with Jesus. Now Peter says, I don't want you to worry about this. I've been doing this for years. He's been manning this welcome desk. And uh, nobody's ever been in with Jesus for more than an hour. It's pretty pro forma. So Calvin goes in first, and eight hours go by, and he comes out, and he's dripping with sweat, and he looks to Wesley, and, or to Luther and Zwingli, and he says, Dad, I thought he would never be done with me. Uh, Zwingli goes in next. Ten hours go by, and he comes out dripping with sweat, and he says to Luther, I thought he would never be done with me. And so Luther goes in last, and four days later, Jesus comes out dripping with sweat <laughs> and says to St. Peter, I didn't think that guy was ever going to be done with me. <laughs> there is probably no more discomforting sentence in the English language to we modern Christians than this one. God is not done with us yet. You see, we like to have things finished, don't we? We like to move on to the next chapter. That is unfortunately not the way it works. The assertion that we are called means that we are constantly called to ask the question, what in God's name are we doing in this world? And I mean that in every inflection of that sentence. What is going on with, through, and in us who are called the church of Jesus Christ? You know, life's been hard for religious institutions and conservatives these past couple of years. The things that we want to conserve have been slipping through our fingers at an alarming rate. COVID and what COVID has done to our values and our norms and our assumptions has been nothing short of revolutionary. 
As Exhibit A, I remind you that last year on Reformation Sunday, for the first time in our history, we could not worship because the county had gone to red and we were shut down. What in the name of God is going on around here? Well, it is most certainly not an evolution, and regardless of how it feels, it's not a revolution either. Maybe the best word for it is reformation. One of Luther's favorite sayings is one that he borrowed from his mentor, St. Augustine. Ecclesia semper reformanda est. That is not Greek. That is Latin. The church is always reforming. It was on this exact day in 1517 that Martin Luther posted 95 debating points on the door of his church. He was inviting the powers that be of his day to engage with him in a discussion about what the church was to be doing and what the church was to be in the world. For Luther, the debate that followed was not what he envisioned. It did not take place in the staid confines of a lecture hall at Wittenberg University. It did not just involve him and representatives of faculty and the Pope. It spilled out into the public square where princes and popes and bishops and emperors and priests and just about anybody with a voice got involved with it. It was, as they say in Washington these days, a big freaking deal. I think that's what they say. And today we remember and celebrate both the content and the intent of that debate because reformation, my friends, is not a destination, it is a journey. And also today we celebrate the confirmation of three of our young people who also have not arrived at a destination but are continuing a journey. They will do something today that most of us find difficult, if not impossible. They're going to stand up in a public place and with their own public voices make public witness to their faith. And when's the last time you did that? Ever. Also, at this time, we as a congregation are, are engaged in the early stages of formulating a new vision for our future. We're asking the question, what in God's name is going on around here? Because in the old world, a day like this might have been taken as a day laden with anxiety. But you know what? It feels good today feels good not only because we're able to gather and celebrate the reformation and the confirmation of our young people, but that we are able to gather at all because COVID is still very much a reality. Our world has still been very severely affected by it. Apparently and thankfully, God is not done with us yet. And you know what? COVID isn't even the worst thing that we're dealing with. There is this massive sense of mistrust amongst us. There is hatred and anger and outright fear. It's palpable. It occurred to me this past week that the last time religious folk felt that passion about anything, they nailed Jesus to a cross. Mostly because he came to announce that God was not done with them yet. Let me be clear. The phrase that Luther loved, ecclesia semper reformanda est, the church is always reforming, means that God is not done with us yet. So what does it mean for us who stand as the body of Christ beneath the shadow of a cross in this crazy, crazy world of 2021? It means in part what it has always meant, that God who called us and sent us trusts us to be his people and has given us a mission to do. We might be an imperfect vessel, which is why we're always willing to throw out the old ways of doing things and no longer, that no longer work, as painful as that might be, to find new ways to be faithful, but also because Reformation is not a destination, it is a journey. And God is not done with us yet. The church is not a stopping place for God's people to catch the breath. It is the starting place. It is the chalk at the beginning of the race. It's where we start God's mission. The church exists to help people get a feel for how God shows up, not just in the Bible or in the sacraments, but in the neighbor and in the stranger and in this ephemeral world of places and people where we least expect to find him. Today is our annual opportunity to dwell on the past, to celebrate the present, and to set our faces like a flint toward the future, to answer the question, what in the name of God is going on around here? Great ideas create institutions to embody them. 
to implement and express them. Monotheism, just another religious idea until they built temples and enlisted priests and created creeds. Democracies, just a poli sci experiment until they wrote a constitution, made three branches of government, elected legislatures, set up courts. The internal combustion engine was just line drawings on graph paper until a visionary named Henry Ford built a factory, engaged engineers, hired and trained a workforce and a sales force. In all of these cases, over time, those institutions lived in tension with their founding principles and sometimes they got in the way of those founding principles until somebody found a way to realign them back to their mission. It was Thomas Jefferson who famously wrote, every generation needs a new revolution. Well, it seems to me I've been through three, maybe four. I'm done. <laughs> In the 60s, with its drug subculture and great society, it gave way to the 70s with Watergate and hyperinflation, which gave way to the 80s with mourning in America and the rise of the Christian right, which gave way to the 90s and the Clinton impeachment and the Tea Party. And then the election of our first black president, which paved the way for the rise of white Aryan nationalism. That's just one more revolution that I'm ready to get deal with. Today, we simmer and we feud. We threaten to refight the Civil War. If this is this revolution or is it reformation, I don't know. Maybe it's neither. But I do know healthy institutions, at least healthy churches, regularly invest time and resources to step back, to remember their mission, to ask what in the name of God they are doing because they know God is not done with them yet. In her book, The Great Emergence, sociologist Phyllis Tickle reminds us that every 500 years, the church itself, a reflection of the mission of Jesus, has this giant rummage sale. <laughs> it makes, gets rid of old forms and old practices and old traditions and old structures to make way for new ones. Around 500, it was the fall of Rome and the rise of the papacy. Around 1,000, it was the great schism between the East and the West. They created the Catholic and the Orthodox faiths. In 1500, well, we're remembering that today. It was the Reformation. Tickle says we're due. We're due. And maybe we're in the middle of one of those 500-year turns. And three things, she said, happen whenever the church holds their rummage sale. First, a new form of Christianity emerges. Second, the old form gets reconstituted and it starts to say new things in new ways, becoming less rigid and stronger. And third, the faith explodes. It explodes. Now, that's not exactly what we're feeling like right now, is it? It's because God ain't done with us yet. 504 years ago, this very day, Luther posted his 95 thesis on the door of the church for renewal. He wanted to remind the church of its mission. Instead, he launched the Reformation. The Reformation spread beyond boundaries. It spread across the globe. The Reformation brought new energy, new ideas. Reading the Bible and the language of the people led to public education, stuff we take for granted. Public education led to appreciation for the arts, which led to congregational singing and the chorales of Johann Sebastian Bach, which we don't even sing anymore. Both individualism and divisiveness exploded. Where two or three Lutherans gather, there is at least four or five opinions. Trust me. The church has splintered into denominations. Lutheran, Roman, Baptist, Reform. It's kept on dividing and subdividing until today in America. There are over 250 uh, uh, denominations in this country. And that doesn't count the 25,000 unaffiliated churches that don't belong to any denomination. Tickle argues that in the 500 years since the Reformation, we are now in the midst of another rummage sale and something new is being born. We just don't see it yet. But one thing is for sure, God is not done with us yet. And you can see glimpses of that all around. Really, you can. Structures, traditions, they might be shaking. The church might be running out of clergy. It might be a lot smaller than it used to be, but something else is happening. New forms are emerging. New ways are being tried. People who would never darken the door of a church are tuning in online. Can you imagine that? New Christians are finding new ways to, find, to get these new expressions of the faith and get them out to people. And here we are with our 90s open architecture and pastors still in robes and singing traditional hymns and we just reconstituted our, our electronic organ into a pipe organ for heaven's sake. We're going back. But we're still witnessing and growing strong in the midst of it all. What in the name of God is going on? 
Well, I have an idea to add to that rummage sale. There's some things we shouldn't put up for sale, some things so valuable, so precious, they need to remain part of who we are and what we are becoming. And I think it is why we are still here, here to remind our, uh, to remind that whatever is to be born is that what is good and faithful and honorable about our traditions. That's why I think I'm still here after 30 years, <laughs> to help keep alive the idea of ecclesia, semper, reformanda est, not to give in to something, but to participate in whatever is emerging. Because like every Lutheran before us, we must set our face like a flint toward the future. But when you plan for the future, you need to honor the past, to return to your roots. You need to talk about your purpose and your mission. Our institution has been around for 504 years. It's changing right now before our very eyes. God is not done with this yet. He's in the process of creating something new, a new church for a new age. But part of the struggle means the death of business as usual. It means denominations are going to have a real problem dealing with this new thing that God is doing. And that's okay. It really is okay. Because I believe God is also calling us to be flexible and loose and responsive, yet at the same time to hold fast to those traditions that produce congregations like this one. There is and always has been this deep conviction amongst Lutherans that God is eternal and nothing else is. Not even our best ideas, our best rules, our best institutions, all of those fall under the authority, the love, the grace, and the judgment of God. All of those must be open to reformation, which is what Jesus meant, I think, when he said to the traditionalists of his day, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. We have always proclaimed that Jesus is the truth, not ideas about Jesus, not creeds that confess Jesus, not churches and hierarchies that represent Jesus, not constitutions or confessions or processes. None of those are the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth, the truth in whom there is wholeness, the truth in whom there is freedom. And this is what I and what Luther meant when he stood before the church authorities and the power of the Holy Roman Empire in his, in his day, and they told him to shut up. And he said, no, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. Our tradition remembers this and reminds his church that he is the truth. He went into the world to give his love and knowledge and heart, even his life, away as a gift. And I believe the church that emerges from this rummage sale will be as shockingly bold as he was. A church that lives out its life in the world like he did its arms and its heart wide open, a church that invests its resources and its life in the caring for the people of this world, no matter what their color, no matter what their creed, no matter what their belief, no matter what their sexuality, because that's what Jesus would do. And that's who we are, the body of Christ in the world. That is what's going on around here in the name of God. I think the church that's emerging is going to be as grateful and as joyful and as confident as those first disciples were when Easter finally sunk into them. Because it took a while, remember. Jesus just appearing did not do it. It had to sink in. And that church became compelling because it was faithful to its Lord's mission. That's a church that knew how to give and to love like its Lord did. And I can't wait to see what the new church looks like. Because here in this church on this busy street, with its own heart, its own soul, its own arms, always open to the world. I am so very, very grateful to be a part of this journey. And I commend it to you as well. Happy Reformation Day. And to God be the glory. Amen.
you are able, I invite you to stand and together let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us intercede before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the sake of the church, the world, and one another. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the life-giving and purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for his gifts of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord, and joy in your presence. Thank you for reforming, renewing, and sustaining your one holy Catholic and apostolic church on earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Pour out that spirit upon your church. Make it your holy habitation. Keep it steadfast in your word. Strengthen it in the face of temptation and defend it from evil. Reform and purify it from sin and error. And bestow on it your saving peace, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be to this congregation a help and redeemer. Gladden our hearts with the joy of your saving presence. Empower us to share our joy and love with those who do not know you. Bless our collaboration with the Lutheran saints in ministry. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Exalt yourself among the nations. Speak your holy words to the leaders of this earth. Teach them to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We long for you to break the bow, shatter the spear, and make war to cease. But until that great and glorious day, direct and strengthen all who take up arms in the defense of life and liberty. Be for them a very present help in trouble. Prosper all they do in accordance with your holy will. And bring them home safely and soon. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, we lift before you the needs of all whose lives are shaken by suffering and those who are in need of any kind. Today especially, we pray for Marie, Mary, Matt, Lakeisha and Joseph, Tammy, Tyler, Karen, and those we name in our silent prayers. Give them your saving help and let them hear you say, be still and know that I am God. And if it be your will, restore them to health and hope that they may proclaim the awesome things you have done for them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Most holy Lord, we give you thanks for the lives of your faithful people whom you have claimed and redeemed through the precious blood of Christ. Grant that we humbly follow in their footsteps, boldly trust in your promises, and faithfully proclaim your word. Bring us through the merits of our Savior into your kingdom, where with the redeemed we shall glorify you forever and ever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayers, gracious God, and answer them in accordance with your will. For the sake of your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray as our Lord taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated, and for our communion distribution, you'll be dismissed by the usher to the outside of your row. We will commune one side at a time, starting with those on the pulpit side. You'll move to the back of the sanctuary and remove your mask and use the hand sanitizer. Come forward in a single line, and then you will receive the bread from me. Gluten-free wafers are available. You'll pick up an empty cup and then move to one of the two communion assistants who will pour wine into the cup, eat of the bread and drink of the wine, place the empty cup in the basket, and then return to your seat and replace your mask. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come as you are directed by the usher.
pray the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you, Lord. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you, pray. The blood of Christ shed for you, Lord. The blood of Christ shed for you. In the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Please stand as you are able. And may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. 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 For the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Spirit dwells in you. Thanks be to God.